Please welcome the Queensland Vice-Chancellors Panel, Professor Jan Thomas, Professor Greg Hill, Professor Sandra Harding, Professor Peter Coldrake, Professor Tim Browsford and Professor Scott Bowman. And I'll leave you now in the hands of the other professor, Stephen Martin. Thank you. We're having a bit of a discussion before uh, we started today and uh, we're also a couple of us having a bit of a yarn over, over lunch. And uh, apropos what I was commenting on about growth and uh, the need to get the budget deficit under control, um, the, the nature of US politics, what's happening in the UK, the nature of the rest of the world. And uh, Professor Coldrake said, look, it ain't all that bad. Peter, why isn't it all that bad? What, are we, what, what do we as a, as a nation, what, are, what benefits have we got? But do you believe <coughs> still, to start the conversation, we need to engender this growth strategy? Um, thanks, Stephen. I think we have an, a national habit of catastrophizing issues. And we certainly have that tendency in the university sector. If you look at the Australian university sector from outside, we are a well-performing system by international standards, and we're going in the right direction. There has been, for a long period of time, a bipartisan agreement as to how undergraduate students would be funded. There has been some fracture around that with the deregulation debate. But, uh, and of course, we have a system that, like any other system uh, that is partially publicly funded, excuse me, gentleman on my right, um, we, we have a, a partly publicly funded system. We sort of recognise that the pressures on public finances are relentless, that we will, over time, have to increase our revenue base, but the government contribution um, is steadily being eroded. And so, I mean, I think that we all should accept that as a challenge of our time and as an exciting opportunity. Uh, but we do have a habit of complaining. When people come and say to me, you know, things are bad, I think I should, you know, not sure what I should do, um, and threaten to leave, I sometimes suggest that they go and have a look elsewhere um, and take a look at the Australian system. So I think that we're caught as in, in part of a national malady of... Um, of um, overstating the, the situation because by most standards, I mean, we have issues with the structural nature of the economic challenge right now, but we are in a good place as a system uh, and I think uh, we can actually meet most of our challenges as we go forward. Sandra Harding, is the university that you are responsible for, is it in a good place in terms of regional Queensland? That's what's known as a Dorothy Dixer. <laughs> um, yes, it is. Only because you're a governor of Cedar, but <laughs> please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it is a very, in a very good place. Um, you know, I acknowledge uh, Peter Coldrake's uh, comments there, and I do think that we do have that national uh, habit. And part of the challenge for us also as a very large nation and as a very large state is to understand that there is great diversity across the state. And the fact of the matter is that different regions uh, speak to different um, uh, strengths, I guess, and different opportunities. So um, my university, James Cook University, was uh, first of all established as part of the University of Queensland um, almost 60 years ago now. And the role of that university was to focus on the tropics, not just northern Queensland, but on the issues of the tropical world. And that's in our act. We're to focus on education research, on issues of importance to the peoples of the tropics. Now, the tropics is um, really um, the part of the world that, in my view, is going to matter most um, in the decades to come. Right now, we know it's more than 40% of the world's populations, 55% of the world's children, 80% of the world's biodiversity. Some of the most critical issues of our time are playing out in the tropical world. Um, we know um, that Australia, Northern Australia in particular, lies at the intersection of the two great axes of global growth, the Asian axis, which everyone's seeing, but also this tropical axis, which will have, um, driven by demand, and, and we've been doing quite a lot of work on this, uh, on the demand side, we know full well that there is going to be great and growing demand for the sorts of services and products that we know how to produce in Queensland and certainly in northern Queensland. We know how to build roads in tropical environments. We know how to build bridges. We know how to distribute services in rural and remote areas. We know how to manage environments. You know, sometimes 
folk might chat about whether or not we'd do it well or not, but we know how to do that. We have um, fungible knowledge and expertise to sell. So as a university that was established, and I'm quoting here from a foundation document, as Australia's University for the Tropics, in the aftermath of um, the establishment of ANU, so there's sort of echoes really of a specialist type of university here. Um, we're in a, a fantastic place, given the Northern Australia agenda and given the objective growth in the tropical world and the enormous demand that that is going to drive for goods and services and for knowledge and expertise and innovation of the type that we can produce. Scott Bowman, um, you've got a campus down in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. <laughs> and I just wonder, you know... University of Central Queensland, why do you think you can offer something to Melburnians that they can't access in terms of local providers? But importantly, let me come back to the broader question. If we're talking about skilling and training individuals, as we've mentioned in our report about enabling people to contribute to the growth of Australia, how are you doing that in Melbourne and in central Queensland? Mm. Well, we're not just doing it in uh, Rockhampton and Melbourne. We've got, I think, now 25 delivery sites. Uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. We're opening uh, a big campus uh, this year uh, in uh, Perth. And we've got uh, delivery sites in very small regional areas as well. I guess what we are offering is some unique programs. So if you want to talk about Melbourne, uh, we've got an incredibly successful program in ultrasound, an undergraduate ultrasound program. No other university in Australia offers that. And we offer that choice to people in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, as well as in Mackay. Uh, we think that we have a, a unique way of delivering our degrees, which gives flexibility, uh, but not simply online or distance. And we pride ourselves in taking the distance out of distance education. So we are providing something uh, different. And the other thing I think where we are different is that we are a comprehensive university, that we have vocational education and higher education, degree education. And note I said comprehensive and not dual sector. If you have dual sector, you have a divide. You have them and us. You have higher education, where if you have higher education, then you must have something lower education. We don't see it like that. We see that we're a fully comprehensive provider. Uh, look, we do go into communities that ask us to go in there. Uh, I'm not sure anyone from Melbourne ever asked us to go there. Uh, <laughs> why would you? Uh, <laughs> but, well, why would you? Because we are growing. We've, we've brought international students. We've had a big impact on the economics of Melbourne by bringing international students. And now our domestic students are growing in Melbourne as well. So we are a different university. And we have grown into a national university. Uh, some would call us the Australian National Regional University. Others would threaten us with legal action for using <laughs> that title. But uh, that's where we are. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, Greg Hill, your university, of course, is somewhat unique in it. I think you're the last greenfield sited university that was established in Australia. Um, in terms of skilling, in terms of opportunities that you are offering to sustain growth, not only in your own region, but nationally and potentially internationally, are you being successful? And if you are, what, what are the factors that sit behind that? And how are you going to continue to contribute to the growth of Australia through the skills we need for the future? Well, I might, uh, I might build on some of the comments that uh, my colleagues have made. For USC, our mission, and as Sandra said, uh, Queensland's universities, Australia's universities are a very diverse lot. And while we whinge a lot, I'd like to think that's part of the Australian character. It's, it's not uh, isolated to us. But for a regional institution, we like to think we're really embedded in the communities where we work. In terms of building our communities, it's about looking at what the workforce needs are and also balancing that against uh, what our students want to do. Like most universities, we've uh, adopted wholeheartedly uh, technology 
We've invested very heavily in um, technology-driven education. We're a face-to-face -face institution, uh, but we like to think we're, we're right at the, the head of the queue when it comes to using technology for teaching and for getting students uh, out into the workplace. Um, like CQU, but perhaps not to the same extent as Scott, uh, we are broadening our geographic footprint. Uh, we look at the communities around us that don't have provision of direct access to university level study, and we think we can make a really important contribution to the Australian economy by engaging with those communities. Uh, we're 20 years old this year. Uh, looking back to the Bradley Review with her 4020 targets in metropolitan Australia, you have got that 40% engagement rate with higher education, but that's not the case in regional Queensland or regional Australia, uh, where engagement with post-secondary education is only half of what it is in the metropolitan capitals. So for us, um, we want to change that statistic, and like other universities to do it, uh, we're broadening our footprint. So at, at present, we're looking at establishing a comprehensive uh, campus in Morton at Petrie, it's about 440,000 people there at present. Uh, QUT has a presence with a, a campus at Caboolture, uh, and we intend adding to that with a, with a major campus facility there at Petrie. But we're also in Melbourne, uh, and I think we're there for the, the same reason as CQU and other universities, that there is a demand there for additional providers. Uh, the Victorian government has been very aggressive in embracing the international student market and they have doubled their share of the pie in terms of international students in recent years uh, at the expense of states like Queensland. And for us, there is, there is business there that will contribute to our business model and there are students there who are looking for different sorts of services that different university providers uh, will provide. <coughs> So it's a pretty rich tapestry. Um, like all the vice chancellors, we think we're doing pretty well. Uh, we complain about policy settings and various things that are done to us, but we're an adaptive lot and uh, we get on with it. And I think the success of universities in Australia, uh, despite in many cases, I think government decisions, uh, indicates a real resilience and also that uh, universities are pretty savvy places in a business sense. So that's where we are. All right, thank you. With so many of you involved in Melbourne, if you're looking for an advisor, I could be <laughs> available. Um, Jan, one of the issues that we tackled, and, and it was just mentioned a moment ago in passing, but um, that we tackled in our report about growth specifically, and it was the number one thing, and it's on everyone's lips, or certainly the Prime Minister, and that's innovation. How, how is your university approaching this broad question of innovation, delivery techniques, seeing that uh, the students that are attracted to your institution are being not only utilising the technology to educate themselves, but they're getting a, a broader view as to how technology um, is going to assist them when they are taking jobs in the Australian community or beyond. Thanks. Uh, and I guess I could spruik USQ um, endlessly as well. And we do it basically through the way we design our teaching programs and through our research that interdigitates with our industries and communities. But I actually um, would like to shift it a little bit more and talk about innovation in regional Australia because I think this is a forgotten piece in this whole growth agenda for Australia. And for regional um, Australia, it's often forgotten. I think we sometimes think the intellectual life ends at Mogul, and there's nothing west of Mogul that has any intellect at all. Um, but uh, if you think about it, there actually is around 30 uh, regional centres across Australia that have 40,000 or more people, and indeed the productivity of those centres is growing at a faster rate than Metro. So when you talk about innovation, you often need to think about the broader landscape. And one of the challenges I have is when we discuss things like this and look at the reports that we have in front of us today, uh, you get this image of a future Australia that has 
uh, perhaps a little bit of a Mad Max Fury Road uh, feel about it. You have these major five meg mega cities with all the pollution and traffic snarls that we need to find expensive solutions for, and yet we have this kind of badlands um, out uh, with ro robots and drones out <laughs> in regional Australia. And in fact, innovation and productivity can be driven out of this um, tapestry, this mosaic of uh, major regional centres if we actually proactively think about how that might be driven. And yet we often miss that piece when we talk about policies uh, that will drive Australia's economic uh, future. Uh, and I would encourage people to think beyond the, me the mega cities of um, what's described and think about how we can drive innovation. And so universities play a very key role in that because we are located out in regional centres. Many of my colleagues here are, in fact, headquartered in regional Australia. And the drive um, and intersection into industries is absolutely profound despite policy settings. So I actually think this is um, that they come together. We shouldn't think about universities in isolation. We do already have that triple helix of collaboration between government, universities and business to drive innovation for the sectors that we serve and drive productivity. And as I say, regional Australia is often overlooked, but in fact is the kind of the engine room of much of the um, economy that Australia needs so desperately to be successful. Thank you. There's a lot in that. We'll come back and pick up some of that in a moment. Um, Tim, the issue around collaboration between Australian business and the university sector has been the subject of a, a great deal of debate. Um, uh, there is a view that the business community claims that the university sector doesn't get it when it comes to R&D, innovation, doing the things that can be readily commercialised. Uh, some people in government say that universities need to commercialise, commercialise, commercialise their R&D work. From your experience, and again, reflecting on needing to have a, a growth agenda for Australia, and if, as the statistics would indicate, something between 80 and 90% of the R&D that goes on in this country is actually done by big business, how do we link together that question about the business community understanding universities, universities working more closely collaboratively doing the things that they can do on behalf of business, commercialisation, but also contributing it to a broader growth agenda for Australia. Yeah, well, Stephen, can I first of all um, acknowledge Kyle, because I understand that she does the seating arrangements. And last year you had me on the far left. And I don't know that, whether that was a poor joke, but of course people in the audience said, well, actually from the audience you're on the far right. <laughs> <laughs> so you've suddenly decided I'm, I'm centre right or centre left this year. Uh, look, the, uh, the, the issue of industry engagement, collaboration with business uh, looms large. It's always, been, it's always been about, I mean it's topical at the moment, it's topical at the moment I believe because we have uh, a government which is trying to set a different agenda and uh, we have uh, some examples overseas where countries have moved more or less, in a lot of cases, less successfully from one uh, economy transitioning to another. And we're, we're, at that, um, we're at that tipping point ourselves in terms of the, uh, the national economy here. Look, I, I would put it another way, which is, and in the great tradition of vice-chancellors, I cannot remember who said this quote, so I'll claim it for myself. Uh, the innovation is a state of mind and uh, in our case we are of course founded outside of the public sector, we were founded outside of the government sector um, and so as an aside, if you want to try and run uh, an innovation agenda, try and set a private university up from scratch with no government support whatsoever and a non-profit status so you can't give your investors any return. <laughs> right, and that's the challenge. And, and I guess what we have learnt along the way is you cannot do it by yourselves. And so that engagement with business has been something that's been in our ethos. It's a value of the institution. I'm not saying we necessarily get it right. I think there are some fantastic examples across the sector uh, where there, is, there are specific highlights of the business academe interface.
But I, I say it is a state of mind because it's the way in which you think and I think it's on both sides. And let me just give you two examples. I think that by and large, uh, we've had it pretty easy in Australia. I think our corporates by and large have uh, ridden off the back of a nice uh, coincidence of economic forces that have all ended up in a rather large wave that we've all rode for quite a while. And um, there's been some selfishness there and uh, the private sector is very much private sector orientated in that regard. And I think the universities have not really had to engage in that sense. And if you look at our uh, reward, our promotions processes, our recognition of staff. But there's not too many academics that sit down at the end of each year and they have to go through their performance review and their supervisor actually says to them, what's the extent of your industry engagement this year and let's set some goals up for next year. Right, so, so it's a two-way street in that regard and I think we can talk all, the, all we like about sort of investment and whether or not we've got the right, uh, we got the right smarts and whether we've got the right technology. I think it's a bit more fundamental than that. I think we don't have the human systems in place and we just don't emphasise that enough. And so industry doesn't value, really value the quality of a PhD and what that means and I think universities have never done a great job at selling the value of that. When you happen to stumble across a well-educated individual, people say, where have you been all my life? Uh, but we just don't have that mindset and I think it's more changing that mindset which is going to do more, more than any sort of high talk about, uh, about where we may head as a transition economy in that regard. Sandra, a little earlier you talked about some of the strengths in your institution and one of the things you said in passing was you know how to build roads, you know how to do infrastructure. What does that mean in terms of how... For example, with Northern Australia, the conference the last couple of days that it's been held in Darwin, I remarked to you a little earlier, if you're talking about repositioning Australia, if you're talking about uh, governments uh, embracing a, a growth agenda for Northern Australia, um, and you are talking about the role, therefore, that higher education institutions that are based in that part of Australia uh, may play in that, um, how do you go about building infrastructure? What's the contribution you make to that? And secondly, how do you engender that conversation more widely in Australia? Because I've got to tell you, south of the tropics, nobody's talking about Northern Australia. They're not in Melbourne, they're talking about his university coming down there. Mm -hmm. um. Where will I start? Actually, <laughs> what I'd like to do, first of all, is to um, just respond to Tim's comment. And if I can just elaborate that a little bit, and then I'll get back to the, the question you're, you're raising. So um, I think Tim's right around the state of mind and the human system. And I fear that I gave this same anecdote about 12 months ago, because I've heard it again this year. Um, and, and again, I think that the challenge for us is that there are two parties to this dance. There is higher education, at least two, higher education and there's business and industry. And um, the story that I told was of one of our um, really top flight engineering graduates, first class honours, uh, C and Barton Medal, which is like the elite of the elite. Um, it's, it's the top, top student who is very eager to go out into industry um, and to um, get you know, some experience out there. I've always thought he might come back and do a PhD went out into industry and was so disappointed with what he found. He said that his employer, which was a very major firm, only wanted to use a fraction of what he could bring to bear because what that business at least was doing was reproducing what engineering graduates could offer 20 years ago. So somehow or other there needs to be a conversation or some mechanism, whether it's a, a systemic sort of approach where we can get together um, in order to further drive. Um, and I don't want you to imagine for a moment that this is a totally barren space, because it's not. I mean, there are legendary and wonderful industry-university collaborations, whether that's in teaching and learning or in research and, and, industry and, and innovation. But for me, that story from that student sort of characterised part of the challenge for us is that sometimes I think we are preparing students um, in the manner that you know, I guess we're trying to be forward-thinking uh, in that way, and I'm sure business is forward-thinking too, but we're not really talking the same language, which I think is a real challenge for us. And what I get to then, just off the back of that, is that um, I was talking to somebody about this just yesterday up in, up in Cairns. Our students 
do not want to and have no concept of graduating and spending 30 years with an employer. I mean, most of them are interested in the maker culture. They're interested in startup space. That's what they're looking to do. They're wanting to leverage their skills into that. So yesterday we had an announcement where the Prime Minister was up in Cairns around uh, some of this development, and we're doing the same thing in Townsville. And a number of our universities are, are very much engaged in that in, in all different sorts of ways. So I think perhaps what we're, we are in general <coughs> in this interface between universities and business and industry, we're at this transition point somehow or other where we're, we're dealing with almost legacy issues of an old industrial model and we're trying to make sure that, that we're preparing human capital for that and engaging appropriately there. But we're also trying to play the role that we can play and business can play the role that it can play in this new generation of business relationships. And I, I think it's, again, I reflect on Peter Coldrake's, um, you know, emotional tag around this. I mean, it's a very exciting space, but it's not an easy space. To, to get back to your question about infrastructure, when I said um, about infrastructure and, and growing, you know, and, and knowing how to build roads and bridges, if that seemed a bit cryptic, just to, to give you the anecdote here, and I might say that this has got legs um, in that last uh, Wednesday morning at 5.15am, the UN United Nations General Assembly voted without dissent uh, to inaugurate an international day for the tropics. And this is a really very important thing. At one level, a day, what's a day? You know, there's days for all sorts of silly things. But what this was, was without dissent and with 75 nations of the world, um, tropical nations but others as well, saying um, the tropics as an economic and social development zone, a political de development zone, is going to matter, does matter now to the rest of the world and is going to matter to the rest of the world. And with the growing middle class, uh, with economic growth rates uh, well ahead of the rest of the world, there is great and growing demand, as I said before, for what we're doing. So the infrastructure anecdote is this. One of my very favourite conversations around the world on this very issue was with a guy from the Belgian Congo. And he said to me, the reason why they, as a nation state, were very, thought this was very important, and I was speaking to Rwanda just yesterday, but because Africa's really important in this world to come, let me tell you. But the reason why the Belgian Congo guy said that he thought that this focus was very important was this. He said, you know, in the past, because they're poor as church mice, okay? In the past, um, when they've needed to go uh, to get some new infrastructure, what they've done is they've gone to their old colonial power or, you know, they've gone to, um, you know, New York, Washington or somewhere to leverage the funds so that they can build something. And he told me this story. He said, we did that a little while ago. We needed a bridge across a river to aid commerce. And they got money and the bridge was duly built. And then uh, the first wet season came and the road washed away either side. So they've got this wonderfully engineered bridge that they cannot use. And what he said to me was, we'd rather look to Townsville or Cairns. We'd rather look to Hawaii. We'd rather look to Singapore, you know, where there is actual knowledge and expertise around how you deliver infrastructure, big infrastructure, particularly urbanising infrastructure. These populations are now 45% of um, tropical people live in urban areas, 46% of those live in slums. They're urbanising at a faster rate than the rest of the world. We're going to have the favelas of Brazil or we're going to have a planned tropical urban environment. So, you know, we're very much getting into that sort of activity as well. So I guess those are the comments. So, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of imagination, and particularly for people in the north, because you have had generations of people who have done this. And in fact, it's perhaps a revelation for some of them that what they've done and done for generations is fungible. It is export earning um, in the world to come. It's export earning now and in the world to come. It's very important that we should grasp, I think, as a state, that sense of difference that we're hearing expressed around this table. And for me, of course, you know, Operation Central is, is the tropics. Peter Coldrake, uh, the issue about skills training for life, is that something that... Um, is realistic in today's society uh, and importantly as well if we talk about the nature of the Australian economy changing if we include within that consideration of this massive industrial revolution that we keep hearing about happening if we think about what skills people are going to need and particularly if robotics take over the world um, is it still a factor that somebody gets trained in a particular role and they stay in that for 30 or 40 years of their work? And if not, how do we, how do we allow for that? Uh, well, no one believes that. 
that uh, they will be staying in those roles. And there are various studies, including CETA studies, that, that, talk, that talk about those things. Um, a study a couple of years ago, I think it might have been mentioned at this um, meeting a year ago, uh, that was done by CETA and certainly at our place, um, we mapped the likely impact of automation and roboticization and so on on our degrees and for about 40% of our degrees the, the, the impact was going to be profound. Um, for another 40% moderate and about 20% they were relatively, uh, relatively durable and some of the durable ones were quite interesting around teaching, nursing and those sorts of care related professions. So universities intellectually and I think professionally understand uh, the extent of that. Um, that they have a real issue around, including ourselves, have a real issue around building the sort of capability that we will need in the future. Because many of the folk who work in universities, their careers have been confined to universities. And as we hire new academics in particular, and especially young academics, we have to try and ensure that they understand and relate to the vocabulary of the outside world. Um, and are able to engage. It's a sort of mission our university um, uh, regards as important in any case. Um, I think we take as accepted that there is a dislocation between business R&D and university R&D in this country, uh, with most business R&D that you referred to in the engineering space, broadly speaking, and the bulk of university-related R&D being in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the health sciences area. Indeed, strategically, Australia risks being, some, being <coughs> something um, of a one-trick pony in terms of most of its research rep reputation being around the biosciences. But let's also not be um, I too, idealis too idealised about all of this. MIT, which is probably um, the best metaphor for industry, government, university engagement that you could point to, only a, only a relatively small proportion of its research funds comes from industry. Um, but it's the effectiveness of the ecosystem that's been developed there which is so powerful and so important for us. Um, the last comment I'd make and picks up uh, uh, other, other um, vice chancellors including Sand relates to our students. Our students are very demanding. Um, they, um, as Sandra says uh, and others have said, they actually um, are thinking about uh, what they do with their own lives. They understand exactly what you said, that the world is changing very quickly. They see um, a degree as providing a platform uh, and hopefully will be all of us be able to pr produce graduates who not only will um, survive in the sort of disrupted world um, we are entering into but they'll be able to thrive in that so I think uh, and a student and students link it very much with the fees they pay uh, when we look at student s surveys every semester um, you'll see student value for money uh, you know value of degree and so on being linked um, to their own views um, uh, as consumers. So that'd be my responses. Tell me about that, Peter. <laughs> Jan, you, you, in your comments, uh, which I found extremely interesting from the perspective of, of sort of looking at uh, the whole of the economy and, and where universities play a role, but you were concentrating more on the whole of the economy, and you talked about improving productivity. What is necessary in Australia to lift our productivity, our performance, so that we can again identify where we have a comparative advantage against other nations in something that we do. Is it in our human capital? Is it in our innovative capacity? Is it in advanced manufacturing? Where do you think we can lift productivity? Not, not speaking from your university per se, but in terms of Australia. So uh, if it was easy to solve, it would have been solved by now. It's obviously multifactorial. But if I was to look at uh, a couple of, the, couple of the big issues that I think are necessary to drive productivity, firstly, it would be no surprise to you that I think uh, getting every Australian as educated as possible, regardless of where they are, are located or regardless of whom they're born to, is critical so that we have the human capability. We only have 24, 25 million people. Our wages are high. We can't really compete on straight labour, even if that was the way the future was, and it's not. So we need every Australian to be as educated and as contributing as much as they can to a smart economy. The second thing that is often missed and is also missed in this um, report is the connectivity of Australia uh, is actually a national crisis. Um, things, the digital divide between the bush and the city is quite marked, and if you were going to drive 
um, innovation, uh, productivity. We need to be um, able to um, access the World Wide Web and the markets that that uh, brings to us. We need to have the skill set to be able to do that and we need to be able to do it fast and in a competitive way. We won't be driving um, to the digital economy. We will be dialing in at the moment, but hopefully we'll just be able to click on uh, in the future. So the, the idea uh, that um, every Australian is capable and then connected is a key part of driving productivity, uh, I think. And then, and then the less, the, then the next piece of it is to make sure that, uh, however, um, wherever we can, we allow that to happen without getting in the way by excessive you know, regulation, bureaucracy, reporting, and so on. Now, I'm a fan of having some of that. We certainly need that, and we certainly need a safety net for Australians. But so often uh, we find, um, you know, it would be really great if someone could just get out of the way and allow these people who are creative, innovative thinkers to just get on with the job of driving Australia uh, so that it's nationally and internationally competitive. Okay. I, I just might point out that that connectivity question between Bush and City was certainly covered in our report on the future of work. Um, and again, I just invite people to go online and, and check that out uh, because it does raise some of the other questions. And I suppose, in that sense, uh, um, um, you know, Scott and, and, and Greg might have a comment around just regionalism per se and the contribution to how we need to lift our skilling and the productivity as a, as a result of that. You, you Scott. Look, I think in terms of universities and what we're doing with our degree education, it is pretty impressive. And I think we've had a really good record of producing people with the skills they need for the jobs that are there now. But, you know, for many years, we've also made our graduates into lifelong learners so they could adapt and pick up those skills as jobs change. I think where we've got a real problem uh, in Australia is with our vocational education. And I think that there needs to be a ro revolution with vocational education. I think now we've got this competence-based model where, you know, we're teaching people a certain set of competences and when they've picked up those competences, then they're qualified to go and do that but to do jobs that really won't exist in a few years. Now, there is some knowledge under, ba un, uh, under, under those uh, competences, but I think we need to do much more about making lifelong learners uh, out of our vocational students. I think our vocational system over the last five to ten years has been absolutely wrecked. I think it's in an absolute mess. And we really need to get that sorted out. Because if we're talking about robots and what have you, it's going to be the vocational students who are going to be fixing those robots uh, to a large extent. I think the other thing I'd say, and you asked what drives uh, innovation, I think what drives innovation is crisis. And uh, if you have a look, when were the most innovative times really in the history of the world? It's probably going to be the First World War and the Second World War. Well, hopefully we're not facing another world war. But we are facing a crisis. Uh, you know, we are seeing uh, an ageing population. I think this is where the CEDA report was a bit lopsided. You know, it was all about robots and computerisation and apps to see if your dog's happy and things so that your toaster can talk to your fridge and all of that stuff. But really where the big issues are are really in society. And there's Ian Milne over there from Mercy Healthcare. We're actually concentrating much more on social innovation, and that's where we're putting uh, our innovation efforts, because I think that's where the crisis is coming, and that's where we need to tap into the skills of our students so that we can address uh, these social issues through social innovation and social entrepreneurism. Let me just say, Scott, my friend, <laughs> I thought you might come back on this. Let me just say about the talking fridge. Now, what I want to say to you is around the vocational education and training, guess what? That's the next piece of research that CEDA is releasing on the 27th of August. So when we do something up in here, Brisbane, thereafter, I expect to see everybody coming along to hear about the people that are being skilled to look after the robots that fix the talking fridge. 
Uh, available in all good bookshops. Yeah, available in all good bookshops. Look, a very quick uh, response uh, from, from Greg around that broader question about uh, skilling and regionalism. Uh, and then I'm going to throw, without cutting out my good friend that's won over, uh, to, to the audience to see if there's anybody that have any questions. We have a couple of roving microphones, if you do. Stick your hand up, please, if you would. Just identify who you are and ask a question of any of the panellists. And I invite any of the panellists, of course, to, to respond as part of that. We always like to have a bit of uh, interaction here. Greg, please. Look, I think one of the real challenges we have is the tension between producing job-ready graduates and the generic skills that we know graduates are going to need when they change jobs. I mean, we, they are going to change jobs. Uh, in the terms, in terms of our professional degrees, um, they're accredited by the professions, and to some extent, we're at their mercy in terms of curriculum, what we put in there. Uh, business similarly has ideas on what it wants in degrees, and politicians are fixated with job-ready graduates. So, I think one of the big challenges for the world ahead is how we balance, how we come out with more rounded graduates who are going to need, who are going to change. And um, it, it's a big challenge. And I, I think universities do a lot in this space, but I'm not sure they get a lot of encouragement. Um, there's this idea that people are being prepared for a particular job. The universities and just thinking in terms of regional universities, if you go to JCU or any of Queensland's others, other regional universities, there's the very best in technology there. And in our own case, we've, we've got the new Sunshine Coast University Hospital opens next year. And $2 billion building, it's got all the robotics, uh, the technology is amazing. Uh, our advanced level nursing students will be living in that hospital for their final year. But I think it demonstrates the sort of challenge we all have um, when you get up near the top of the queue and you have a look at what the latest and the best is. Uh, we really need to be giving our graduates, regardless of what profession they're in, access to the, the biggest and the best and the sharpest. And getting back to Jan's point, uh, there's no reason that can't be in regional Queensland. It doesn't have to be in metropolitan capital. Thank you. A, a quick... Just a quick comment, just to say that um, the bogey person of um, professional accreditation has been raised. Um, I think that... Um, and we, we all take accreditation very seriously of our professional programs because, frankly, it allows graduates to work anywhere uh, and their qualifications to be accepted. But universities... We are complicit. We are complicit with some of the issues around professional bodies because quite often the professional bodies are highly influenced, if not controlled, by academics. And we tend to be, a con in some disciplines, quite a conservative force against change in that very professional accredit accreditation, which we then use to justify where we are. So I think we've, I think we've got to accept our own responsibility in, in at least some of the professional areas. Thank you. I have a question here. Thank you. Thanks very much. Caitlin Byrne from Bond University. It was fabulous to hear all of you speak about the role that universities play in contributing to Australia's agenda for growth. I'm interested in widening the lens a little bit to understand the role that universities play contributing to regional growth, so thinking beyond our shores, because Australia's growth is inevitably tied to the growth of our region. And Sandra, I thought it was fascinating hearing your discussion about this connection between the tropics as well. <coughs> so I wondered if there might be panellists who could really discuss the, the role of universities, not just as education providers, but potentially diplomatic actors forging relationships in the region. Jan, please. Uh, I think the, uh, it's a well-trodden path to talk about um, the cultural exchange and value that comes from international students and Australian students going internationally. But I'd like to take another slight slant, and I think it comes to your point about you know uh, being a diplomatic actor. I think Australian universities are particularly um, outstanding in their 
in their role as civic institutions and really ensuring that our uh, community, our nation, is imbued with some of the values that underpin um, the, the academy, things like freedom of speech, human rights, uh, academic freedom and so on. Uh, our Australian universities uh, do that very well. Many developing nations are striving to achieve that in their university systems. And it, we've also observed that in places like Hong Kong, it's a very frail system, even if it was established. So that role as a civic institution, providing um, people with the skill sets and capabilities to uh, act um, intelligently on scientific and uh, social you know, evidence so that they can influence democracy. Uh, we do that very well. And by working internationally, we're also working with other countries to develop their higher education systems to play that fundamental role as a civic institution, which is absolutely critical for mature democracies and many countries are striving for. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, let me just put a slight twist on that, which is universities have traditionally been a great bastion of the principles and values of humanism. And so we have protected values of society, we have been apolitical, we haven't been beholden to particular religions, nor have we been beholden to particular governments. And we've been doing that for over a thousand years. And a lot of that has all been about relationships and the respect of fellow human beings. I think one of the great challenges as we move forward is that the digital era is putting upon us a new way of teaching and learning, and it's where universities are going to, how universities are going to continue to play such an influential and important role over the development of the human in that digital space. And so you then extrapolate that to international relations, and where I think Australian universities have always played a very strong role in our region. Have, has been primarily through the relationships that have been formed. It's not just the traditional disciplinary expertise that people have established, but it's the relationships that have been formed and it's a different way of thinking and acceptance of cultural values. And how we do that when you're sitting in front of a computer screen, I think is a great challenge for not just up here, us up here, but everyone in this room. I have a question up the back. Thank you. Hello, Carmel Sang from Queensland University of Technology. Um, recently, we've been travelling some of the um, universities in our southern areas. Um, what was really highlighted through that was the um, role of philanthropy in um, building better universities so that we can actually go out and deal with Australia's growth agenda, etc. We haven't heard anything about philanthropy and certainly in Queensland, it doesn't seem to be something that we're leading in. I'm just interested in comments about how we grow philanthropy in this state. I have a bond. Greg, thank you. Uh, well, I think all universities are very actively involved in philanthropy. It, it's something that I've seen huge changes in in the last five or so years. And I guess we always benchmark ourselves against what's happening in the US. But I, I think it's happening here. Certainly, we've put together some information recently, sort of a, a checklist of the things on campus where philanthropists have contributed to the, the, the form and function of the university. And it's a really powerful story that, that we're keen to get out there so that um, more people who are in the community who can afford to give um, do it. But for us, it, it ranges from scholarships to art galleries to um, buildings for staff. Um, with, we had a gift of $5 million a couple of years ago now to build a car park where the parking fees go into school into uh, student scholarships for disadvantaged students. But um, I think the tide's changed on that one. And I'm sure my, my colleagues have been in the same position as me that we spend a lot of time talking to potential donors. And it's not so much about selling a university, it is selling how a gift through a university can benefit uh, the local community and society. And I think that's the, the really interesting thing from my perspective, that it's, it's not about people giving to my university, it's about them giving to their community and they recognise that a university is the right vehicle um, to be doing good. Peter, a very quick comment. 
Uh, just to say that the oldest universities tend to have the most mature systems. I mean, in this state, I think UQ's done a, a fantastic job um, over a long period of time with some very prominent donors. They all provide good examples. The biggest and most significant philanthropist in Australian history anywhere is Chuck Feeney, who, of course, has taken a, a, a very strong liking to Queensland over the years. Many people know that story here. I think that for Queensland, the ch particular challenge was developing a system behind that. Um, my university, QT, has put uh, a lot of effort into, um, into supporting um, and to uh, promoting philanthropy in terms of supporting student opportunity. Um, but Australia has an immature system by, by when compared to America, but I think, I think the game in higher education is changing quickly. Final, final contribution for the private sector. Yeah, just, just a bit of a one-liner, which is actually a true story. We did a bit of benchmarking with some private US colleges a few years ago. And there's an institution called Dartmouth College, which is up at Connecticut, um, quite old, quite established, uh, prestigious. And they said to us, yeah, we struggled for the first 350 years with philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> sadly, sadly, uh, that does bring to a close the opportunity for, for some questions. But uh, as chairman, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sorry, Kyle, but I'm going to ask one final question to Tim. Mate, have we got it right in our report, our first report on which this follows, that we need to get the federal government budget back into balance sooner rather than later? Absolutely. Um but I, I don't think it's just the, the question of the overall fiscal position. I think it's also the composition of the expenditure of the portfolios that sit underneath that. Right? And so you can, you, you can afford to run a budget deficit as long as you are on the road to repair and, uh, and you are actually going to generate some positive return. Okay. So I think the two issues we face is the overall fiscal position, but then it's also the internal allocation mechanisms, which are now just so incredibly politicised. Right? And, and so we really look for sort of small incremental changes. And the, the other issue I think we're all bound by, and you know, it's almost non-PC uh, to talk about it anymore, is labour market reform. You, know, you, want to, you want to improve productivity, um, let's have a look at some of the rigidity which is built into our labour markets. <coughs> which, which, of course, is in our report. Yeah. <laughs> I just point out what I put a great Dorothy Dixit. But okay, thank you for that, and thank you for backing in Cedar's report on budget repair, which is great. And of course, uh, you're right; it is about uh, fiscal responsibility, and quite obviously, it means prioritising. And clearly, at the top of the list would be education. Thank you. So. Um, could I now please, uh, on, uh, on your behalf, thank our panellists, but to formally do so, uh, I'm going to invite uh, our colleague from UniSuper, the Chief Executive Officer from UniSuper, to propose that, uh, that vote of thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.